So welcome. Uh, this is the overview and highlights mid-scale research infrastructure activities at NSF. And you guys are in for a special session today for many reasons. I think you've heard that this is the first workshop that we've had mid discussions of mid-scale at this, at this breath. Secondly, that you have a great panel of BFA folks here that we're going to introduce here in a minute. I'll go this way. So uh, I'm going to start. I'm Florence Ravenel. I'm a research infrastructure advisor in the large facilities office at NSF. Um, and I think next up is Rich. I'm going to allow folks to introduce themselves. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Well, Rich Kaczmarek, uh, LFO. I work with Florence very closely, uh, particularly on a mid-scale, but also uh, several major facility projects. And really happy to be here. And I just want to say thank you to all those who organized this beautiful venue and all the hard work that in went into it. Thank you. The Smith, Division of Grants and Agreements, Mid-Scale Program. I work with Jason Madigan and Rich and Florence. My name is Jason Madigan. I work in the Division of Grants and Agreements on DGA's little mid-scale research infrastructure team. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Minnick. I'm the branch chief with the cost analysis and pre-award branch. Um, my division primarily works on um, proposal reviews and provides analysis to, I think, everyone up here on some level. So thank you. Right. And I, I just want to mention, I mean, I think it was Scott McIntosh said this morning, something to the effect that there are no lone wolf projects these days, that we work in teams. And I think this is really illustrative of this, is how we're working together at NSF on mid-scale, supporting mid-scale projects. So I'm going to kick this off. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we want to do today. Um, first and foremost, we want to talk a little bit about some of the key, I'm going to call it key in inventory of key documents. So one thing that I learned a little bit in having discussions is that we can't make assumptions about what docu documents, guidance documents you guys know that are available. So we're going to go through that very, very quickly. We're going to talk a little bit about BFA's pre- and post-award oversight of mid-scale RI projects. So you heard a bit about this at a strategic level. We're going to get down into some of the tactical kinds of things. So if you don't hear that and you have questions, please ask us. Uh, we're going to touch on some of the highlights of the similarities and differences. Again, if you're getting confused, I hear this a lot, is that it looks like they're all the same. Call us out on it, please. And we want to leave some time for some discussions with the crowd. So we have about 20 minutes worth of slides, 25 minutes, and the rest are for you. So what do we have on our topics? Um, roles, BFA roles. Uh, I know a lot of folks don't really know how BFA is organized. We're going to give you a, a look into that. Uh, we're going to talk about, again, that inventory of key documents so that you understand how these things fit together. We hear that a lot. Lots of documentation. How do they work together? Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit again about the big process is how are these things reviewed pre and post award? Where does BFA get involved? And then we're going to talk a little bit finally about the pre post award process comparison. And we've got some uh, tools to talk about. Okay, I promised you a discussion of the uh, org chart. So on the left, I'm trying to get my bearings here. Um, so this is a cutout from the rig. Okay, so where we can, we will reference the rig so you, can, you know where we're getting this from and to remind you that it's out there for referencing. So why do I put it in there? Because we're up here throwing our titles around and you hear us talking about LFO, you hear us talking about CAP, where do we all fit into the bigger picture? So on the left-hand side, you can see the director's position right at the very, very top. And make your way down on the left-hand side to where the CFO sits. So we're within the CFOs, the Chief Financial Officers branch. And across there, then I put circles, and I did miss one circle, and that's my mistake. Starting the very left-hand side is our Division of Institution and Award Support. And that's CAP. This is Sean's shop. Then you can see to the right of that is Large Facilities Office, and that's where I sit. And to the right of that is our grants officers. So Lisa and Jason introduced themselves. They're with DGA. And then you guys probably have met Eddie. And he worked in uh, with the cooperative support branch. So he's no longer there. So together, we work on all these to support the mid-scale projects. So running down the right-hand side of it, I grayed out the program officer, not because it's not important, but it because we're focusing on the BFA roles. But they do have primary oversight responsibilities for the award. Okay. The grants and agreements officers have a legal responsibility and authority. 
for the business and financial management of the award. The liaisons like myself, my colleague Rich, wear advisory and assistance on the project management. And then the cost analysis staff, right? These are the folks behind the scenes that are looking at those cost estimates that you put together. I'm going to hand this one off to my colleague. I think Lisa's going to take this, or Rich, one of the two. Rich has got this. Thanks. So, so these are our big bosses, right? Now that we saw our bosses, uh, the, the true bosses are our documents that guide all we do uh, at NSF, right? So, so when we uh, discuss with you uh, requirements and so on, we don't just invent those. We, we try our best to follow a uh, code of federal regulations, and, and these documents uh, follow the precedents, notice. So uh, the biggest one is the uh, uh, uniform guidance. And notice it doesn't say NSF, right, because it applies to wider wider area of uh, grants and agreements and, uh, and uh, requirements. And NSF then creates its own implementation of this document, which is the PAPPG. But uh, notice it's interesting that uh, in the precedence, uh, precedence uh, the solicitation themselves come before PAPPG in this section. And, and then the rig uh, follows all that. And rig specifically for just a section of uh, of all these uh, grants, just a section specific for construction, design, implementation, operations, uh, and so on. And, and the last one at the bottom, we have uh, business systems review, which uh, we haven't, to my knowledge, best knowledge, we haven't implemented uh, in mid-scale yet, uh, which I think it's a testament to, you know, mid-scale is doing pretty good so far. And uh, we plan this BSRs based on risk. When we see risks in our projects and so on, we will implement BSR to help uh, recipients and so on to, uh, our main goal is to, for all the project to succeed, right? So not to punish someone, but to succeed. So we try to implement all these tools in the, at the right time. But you can see all the uh, flow here. And uh, of course, um, uh, uh, the, the purpose of the rig is to clearly uh, state the required policies and procedures, which I uh, identified in those previous uh, uh, documents. Um, next slide, please. And uh, I will actually uh, explain how, in practical terms, we're implementing that in a mid-scale. Uh, we're going to talk about the planning and oversight of mid-scale. And as you already, many of you already know, that mid-scale uh, has unique characteristics. Some of those characteristics uh, are based on the scope, the type, and the type of work performed. Our review criteria, it rules in the program solicitation. One of the characteristics that many of you are already familiar with is the program execution plan, which is developed on the life cycle of the project. Unless a risk for reward is identified by BFA, there are usually no additional pre-award review requirements. Once NSF and the selection process are complete, and a subsequent award is made. Back to Rich. So uh, maybe you already noticed the trend. There's a guidance. Uh, the recipients in the proposals follow the guidance, develop uh, proposals, and then NSF gets to review those proposals uh, in the selection process. And uh, this slide represents the, uh, the flow of the reviews. And the reviews uh, follow the RIG section 2.3 for major facilities, it's much more involved. And uh, in that section, you, you will see there's project development, which has a bunch of steps and takes some time. And then we have conceptual design, which takes more steps and more time and actually more funding. And then we go into preliminary design. And uh, if you noticed uh, Matt talking earlier today, that's the point where uh, mid-scale differentiates from uh, major facilities because uh, mid-scale doesn't go through PDR. And therefore, no cost overrun policy applies to uh, mid-scale. But the following step for the major facility would be uh, uh, final design uh, review, and and then construction, and then operation, and then divestment. Uh, uh, so so the, all those steps, and for mid scale, we we kind of jump right away into construction, right? Uh, R one solicitations uh, provides opportunity to develop design projects, but if somebody has design ready, could submit proposal with a ready design for R I two, for example. Uh, so that's the difference uh, between uh, the stages and review. And uh, 
uh, the mid-scale itself, the review process starts with technical reviews, scientific reviews, and then the next step of several steps is uh, project management and concept of operations review. That's where it comes to, kind of, that's where the BFA gets to engage and we get to review some of those PEPs which we developed in accordance with uniform guidance, PAPPG, RIG, uh, so, uh, solicitation in between there. Um, and, and this review uh, assess uh, progress uh, and readiness of the projects. Uh, basically, uh, through this process, what we try to do is lower the risk of the project, right? Make sure the project is ready to succeed and, and those best of projects get selected. And, uh, and then I'll, I'll turn over to Lisa, uh, who will present, the, uh, I'm sorry, to Jason, who will present present the next stage, which is, uh, if you follow the trend. You have one more slide. Here we go, okay. But it does, so I'm talking about the slide, but, uh, but what I said is true. This is, if you see the trend, this is the next step in the project development and award. And uh, once we uh, selected the project and reviewed it, and now we think that uh, risk is acceptable for NSF to award this project, we proceed to prepare award. And at this stage, um, we'll develop uh, terms and conditions and work on programmatic deliverables, and we'll negotiate with the recipient uh, uh, the methods of uh, uh, the PEP, making sure that what we saw in the PEP, the missing links, uh, we negotiate, make sure that we're on our same uh, uh, page. And uh, usually, from my experience, this is pretty smooth process, and. Uh, uh, everybody is cooperative and uh, uh, we just make sure that those are usually the things, good things for the project, right? The pro for project to succeed. Uh, sometimes it's um, harder, uh, sometimes it's not as hard, but uh, uh, that's the evolution of the PEP to clo as close to perfection as we can. And uh, in that process, we keep lowering the risk of failure of the project, right? And at this point, uh, <laughs> Uh, I think uh, Jason is going to talk about the next phase, which is award and post-award. Thanks, Rich. So like NSF's traditional research grants and cooperative agreements, uh, mid-scale projects will be assigned a cognizant program officer, and that cognizant program officer will be your main NSF point of contact. As most of you are aware, when NSF issues an award, the cognizant program officer will be identified in the official uh, NSF award notice. And you should technically already be very familiar with this individual because you've had extensive interactions during the pre-award stage. Similar to an integrated project team for our major facilities, NSF uses a similar approach when performing pre- and post-award activities for the mid-scale research infrastructure projects. Uh, the, the large facilities office um, assigns a liaison to each mid-scale research infrastructure project, and this individual will coordinate with the Cognizant Program Officer, the Grants and Agreements Officer. Um, in most cases, the Large Facilities Office uh, Liaison, the Cognizant Program Officer, and the Grants and Agreements Officer will collectively make pre- and post-award decisions. Mid-scale, and you've heard this earlier in uh, presentations, mid-scale projects may be assigned to a grants and agreements officer within the Division of Grants and Agreements or the Division of Acquisition and Cooperative Support. And this decision can really depend on the nature of the project and the funding program. And then last bullet, uh, all mid-scale research infrastructure proposals that consist of upgrades to existing major facilities should be coordinated with the integrated project team established for the specific major facility. Slide, please. So in this slide, we show the pre and post award process differences between traditional NSF research activities that may be funded as a grant or cooperative agreement a mid-scale research infrastructure project that also may be funded as a grant or cooperative agreement and a major facility project that would be funded using a cooperative agreement or the cooperative support agreement mechanism. Shown under the pre-award process, the first element is cost analysis for proposals less than 20 million. As you can see, 
there is a checkbox under the mid-scale research infrastructure column, and in most cases, a cost analysis will not be required unless we believe the LFO, uh, the cost analysis group, uh, the program officer, and the grants and agreements officer, that there are potential risks associated with the proposing organization's ability to meet the NSF solicitation requirements. Uh, next is the cost analysis for proposals greater than 20 million. As shown here, all categories will require cost analysis, and, and this is based on part one, chapter three of the NSF proposal and award policies and procedures guide, research infrastructure guide, and internal NSF standard operating guidance. The primary purpose, and you've heard this earlier, uh, the primary purpose of analyzing a mid-scale research infrastructure proposal budget or project cost estimate is determine cost reasonableness, which should be informed by GAO's or characteristics of a high quality estimate, well-documented, comprehensive, accurate, credible. This information can be found in both mid-scale research infrastructure solicitations. Moving on to the next element, we have identified the need for concurrences for programmatic terms and conditions. As many of you are already probably aware, when NSF issues a cooperative agreement, the NSF program officer may work with the proposing organization to develop these terms and conditions. And prior to award, we ensure that the sponsored research office and the principal investigator concur. The reason for this is to avoid disagreements post-award that could potentially result in significant changes to the conditions themselves. Last element under pre-award process uh, column is project execution plan. And as you can see, a project execution plan is only required for mid-scale research infrastructure proposals and major facilities proposals. One key difference is that we'd like to point out that a project execution plan for a mid-scale research infrastructure project is tailored based on the complexity of the project. And Rich is planning to speak more about this during his session on Thursday. Now we'll move on to the post-award process section, and bear with me here. I know it's a, there's a lot of information in this chart. Um, as shown here, the, the post-award requirements for annual, final, and project outcomes report, the research terms and conditions prior approval matrix, the financial terms and conditions, programmatic terms and conditions, and interim reports fall under each of the categories. Uh, so we're not going to go into too much deal to, detail into that, but you, you can see it's consistent across all three categories. Uh, next is the project status report or equivalent. Uh, this reporting tool is specific to mid-scale research infrastructure and major facilities. And Lisa is going to um, be discussing this in a little more detail in a couple of slides. So uh, remember this topic. Um, that is the updated project execution plan when necessary, and we want to stress when necessary. Any time during the life of a mid-scale research infrastructure project, the program officer can request an updated project execution plan, and the awardees will see this as a term and condition within your award letter or cooperative agreement. Um, if NSF is satisfied with the information provided Project status report or equivalent, the need for an updated PEP may not be necessary. And again, so we'll be providing some again. And last but not least, thank you for bearing with me, um, uh, schedule and cost monitoring, uh, earned value management, and you've heard it before, is not required for mid-scale projects. And NSF has established a scaled approach with a reduced administrative burden and that information infrastructure guide. Um, I'll turn it over to Sean, who will be talking about cost analysis. Thanks, Jason. Yep. Um, so as you can see in this slide here, there's a lot that happens <clears throat> in the 90 day period um, within the pre, pre award review process. Um, the cost analysis and pre award branch, um, which is where I, I am, we provide an independent analysis of your cost proposal. Um, pr mainly for the RI2 um, awards and projects. Um, within that, 
um, independent analysis. Uh, we give a, a summary um, based upon our um, our analysis of you know the financial documents that have been um, provided, um, any policies and procedures, um, and essentially um, when the proposal comes to us, we could review the entire proposal or we can re review specific sections um, as outlined um, through the uh, IPT. Um, along with that, with our analysis, as you can see, there are about one, five um, different offices or different um, stakeholders that will all have an integrated input into the outcome, um, into that overall summary of um, the status of the, of the award to be made. Um, as Rich mentioned earlier, um, we strictly adhere to 2 CFR 200 um, as the basis for um, federal financial assistance awards um, on top of all of the PB, PA, PPGs and all the other acronyms that we've all said um, that um, provide overview for uh, our um, ability to provide oversight for these awards. Um, I wanted to, you know, kind of outline, you know, there four, you know, you know, key areas, allowability, allocable, allow <laughs> that, yep, <Yeah>. um, <laughs> reasonableness, um, and the last one, which, is, which isn't in there, but we believe is important, which is realistic. You know, we, we want to get good faith estimates and proposals in um, that, you know, kind of give us the, 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 the best snapshot of what you plan us to do. Um, how you plan to do it. We, we really would not like, you know, to get astronomically large um, proposals in because then we have to start the back and forth process and asking you questions and then you respond to us. And as you can see, it a lot has to happen in 90 days. So if, um, you know, just some really good good faith estimates would, uh, would uh, be greatly appreciated. Um, reasonableness is, is another, uh, you know, kind of tricky word that you know, um, since I've come aboard to NSF about 18 months ago, um, the scientific community, you, you guys have, you know, some pretty large uh, ticket items that, you know, you have to cover. And um, what's, what's reasonable here won't be reasonable for another award that's not the, the nature of your business. And so, um, you know, we just want you to keep that in mind as, as you're submitting all these proposals to us. Uh, now I'll kick it to Lisa. Reference to the project status report, uh, this is something post-award that uh, we are, we will say, requiring. It can be done on a quarterly basis, it can be done on a monthly basis, it can be done on a semi-annual basis. Uh, as Matt and Roland pointed out this morning, we want communication to be continual. So the project status report is the tool that is going to be used for continual communication. And continual communication leads to a successful project completion. Once NSF and the proposer has reached initial currents on the PEP, the PEP, as Rich has mentioned and Jason has mentioned, only needs to be updated as needed. The project status report is what we really want uh, updated. Therefore, if you have changes in your project's milestones, your budget contingency, uh, scope contingency, cost and performance data, this is the report that should be used. The frequency, as I mentioned before, can be monthly or quarterly. It depends on the complexity of your project. And the project status report should be readily available to the IPT, Interpated Project Team, which is the, the LFO liaison, grants officer, and the program officer. We promised you we'd keep it to 25, 30 minutes. Um, kind of big picture, pretty big picture. There's some details in there, though. We can pull the slides up. But I'm instructed to first check in on the chat or the Whova app to see if we have any questions. Um, anybody, um, Nigel, have you seen any questions in the chat? I'll pull those up. I think they also were going to bring us questions from the back as well as Allison. Um, okay, fantastic, thank you. So we're going to open up the floor to hopefully f folks in the audience. So I encourage questions. Anybody have a question? Blaze. Uh, uh, nice, Lisa. I like the thing on the 
performance report you were doing, you know, that could be quarterly, could be monthly. Now, on existing uh, grants that I've been associated with, we have the annual report and then we have a quarterly report. So am I assuming that this uh, BFA or whatever this uh, report is that you're talking about, is that like the quarterly report would be with milestones, progress on milestones, maybe a nice financial performance snapshot and all that? Is that kind of, is it another word for a quarterly report that could be monthly? <laughs> Let me see. It, it's similar, but it's so much more extensive. The project status report, to me, and to a lot of us, is just a snapshot of the PEP. So say, for instance, when you go to request funding, we don't want to look around and say, oh, when was the last time we met with the program officer or met with the awardee? We want to be able to get that, have that information readily available. So I would say, like an annual report, but more similar to the PEP. It's like an abbreviated PEP. And I'm going to read in a minute. The, um, we did receive a question so on the chat, but I do want to expand on what Lisa's saying about that question about what does that template look like. And it's essentially a reporting template, but what we try to do is provide some examples on the formatting of the information. So think about contingency, right? Is giving, it's not fancy how we want it done, but there is a prescriptive way that we would prefer to have it done to make it simple. Uniformity is really what we're talking about. So what we've done is taken, um, taking the lessons learned that we have, integrate those into a template with some uniform ways of reporting. It's not mandatory, but there are certain key pieces of information. And if we outlay those, then people are, seem to be much happier. It makes our job easier. And as Lisa's saying, we don't get into that back and forth, right? Asking a lot of questions. Does that help, Lise? Okay. I'm gonna, you guys can read this, but I'm told that I'm supposed to read it as well. Um, this individual's asking um, about the mention this morning about the updated solicitations for the mid-scale RI track one and a question about when is that going to be posted and then is there going to be a call for the mid-scale track two and uh, the reference to mid-scale track one is yes but we don't have information on that so as soon as best that we have it I don't have information on track two does anybody want to even try to guess on that or you may know will there be an updated solicitation L2 working group is beginning rewriting uh, the next solicitation. Uh, using the lessons learned uh, from the previous two solicitations, um, it's a process. If you've got uh, suggestions for us, I'd like to hear them. Um, the process, it, takes, it can take a while for it to be published though, but the intention is to get a new solicitation published out there. Um, and I, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> For, for mid-scale two. Right. Mid-scale one is in clearance, and that can take one to many months. And that's everything I can tell you about that. <laughs> and, and for those who don't know, Alina Upper is the lead for a uh, working group for RI2. So pretty much big boss, you know, operational level big boss for RI2. So she knows what she's talking about. Thank you, Alina. Thank, thanks, Elena. Th this is Matt over here. Just a question for you. I think the original solicitation laid out a, 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 a schedule of approximately every two years. Is there any reason to believe why it wouldn't be approximately along those lines? <laughs> <laughs> the original solicitations for both Mid-Scale 1 and 2 stated that the intent of NSF is to Pu uh, publish solicitations every two years. And that continues to be our intent. <laughs> like one of those tennis people. Fantastic. What other questions do we have? A uh, couple of hands, so we'll need mics and um, I think Carol, right? She is also, um, what, I think the mic's over there, so we'll start with Carol. As one question I have is what happens when a project needs more money? Uh, for an example, uh, contingency was, was discouraged for quite a long time for these types of projects, and now uh, with the better cost estimating and risk analysis, contingency is allowed. But what happens if you've used all of your funding and now you need to come back to NSF for additional funding for the mid-scale? What are the steps that people have to go through? Do any of my colleagues want to take a shot at this? Rich? I usually take a shot and then Florence corrects me, so I'll, I'll go at it. Um, 
So contingency is about risk management, right? That's why we use it. We don't just use it to have extra security caution that we don't plan to use. So everything you sign up for, right? In your risk register, every dollar is accounted for in a theory. And, and, and when we execute, we just push the buttons, right? This risk occurred, we're executing, right? And, uh, and of course, not every project is the same. And um, I haven't seen the project that went according to the plan yet, and I've been doing it for a few years. So, so most likely projects will not. Our goal and target is to get as close to that target as we can. But if the project doesn't go well, there's a process, right? Supplemental uh, supplements and so on. And yeah, we have different supplements. For example, we went through COVID, so that was kind of different league in itself, right? But there were all new rules. But there's standard rules for supplements, requesting supplements and so on. And and the best thing is when we learn about it soon, sooner rather than later, because we can react, right? The whole point of having a performance uh, control uh, and, and assessments and the whole plan is to forecast, right? To see something that is coming, trends, right? Our uh, EVM, we're seeing trends, right? We're spending more or working slower than we thought. What are we gonna do about it, right? Versus like we're at the end of a project and we didn't finish on time, right? So uh, managing the risk, right? And those things happen, right? COVID happens. Those are unknown unknowns, right? So hopefully we run out of the money because unknown unknowns, not something that we projected and estimated, you know, within, um, accurately, not precisely, but you know, and and, and so on. How, uh, I, Matt or yeah, Lawrence? I think, I think what Carol's getting to is run through your contingency, right? You followed all the processes and you have no more money left. So there is no cost overrun policy, right? Matt talked about this this morning. So you can have a conversation with the program officer and it's within their authority, if they have funds, to supplement, as Rich is mentioning. And you also have budgeting rebudgeting uh, re authority as well. Matt, what did I miss? Because I know I missed something. That's right. I'm sorry, I'm running back and sorry, making run back and forth. One, just one subtlety, and the team up here has it correct, right? It, it's really just, uh, it's really just a supplemental funding request to program, if it's funded from RNRA, mid scale track one, right, or, or okay. divisional programs. Remember in that little pie chart, the little, the little chart this morning? Track two is funded from the MREFC account, right? That requires NSB approval, authorization from funds from there. So NSF has delegated authority for all of its awards from the board. This is public information. It's in the guide. You can read it in the PAPPG, right? NSF has delegated authority to supplement more awards up to 20% 20, 20 or $10 million, whichever is less, right? That even applies to the, the major, the, the MREFC account. If it goes over that, right? Linnea, lucky her, has to decide, working with program and, you know, the people in the working group, right, whether or not that, that, that action is going to be taken, right? So if it's MREFC funded, there's a lot more internal NSF process to approve a supplemental funding request. As I said this morning, no cost overrun doesn't, policy doesn't apply, but that's a bunch of process when you read the guide, right? Right? Use of contingency, use of management reserve. Management reserve is a major facilities term only, it's not a mid-scale term, right? Because those are authorized again by the board. And so get to separate, it's, it's, there's program at, so there's, there's, so you gotta think about where the money comes from too. And that's a conversation really to have with your program officer who can reach out more broadly to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to answer it if necessary. And Elena might have something more to add. So yeah, Elena and Roland or? Roland, you're helping Elena. And when Alina and Roland getting to it, I'll just mention there's three types of contingencies, right? Scope, schedule, and budget. Alina, it's you. That's what I was going to get to, is that a request for a supplement is simply that it's a, it's a request, and funds are limited. And so you can request, but it would have to be justified and reviewed. The thing is, is that your project manager's got three things to work with, budget, schedule, and scope. And so you could consider descoping as long as the key parameters, the key objectives of the project are not impacted. I think she was up first. Uh, we, she, yep, and you still, have, you still have your question? Yep, and then I know we have a hand, hand in the back. Hear me? Okay, I have a question regarding EVM, because we are mid-scale RI2, um, and we've been doing quite intensive EVM every month. Uh, of course, it takes a lot of time. 
And uh, I can see the value of doing it, uh, honestly. Um, however, our PIs are starting feeling the burden of the administrative work. Um, so we basically have to record our actual cost on every single personnel and you know, track actual cost and then apply those to every single task in our project plan. And then I have to track all of the percent completes at every task level in order to finally produce the EVM report. So that easily takes away my 20 hours each month to get a report out. So I'm curious, if we don't do EVM, is, what would be the alternative that would give the uh, monthly status that NSF needs, you know, to actually show that we're making good progress, you know, and uh, we're doing the work without, um, you know, adding too much burden to the scientists who actually work on things. And so I'm going to, um, because I'm MC, I get to point to Rich and ask if he wants to take any answers, if he wants to try And I'll be more than happy to talk about it. And thank you for voicing it, Chi. Uh, this is wonderful. I just talked to Ernie on another RI2 projects, and he was happy with his EVM. He said he has enough. He's, he's, uh, we kind of suggested to him, because it's a negotiation process. But before I even go any further, I will say that EVM is not required on uh, mid-scale projects, right? And that is stated in uh, Section 5 of the rig. Um, so how we end up with EVM? We end up with EVM because often projects propose the EVM themselves. And, and we're not here to oppose, right? You guys know the projects the best and stuff. If we think it's too much, we will mention it, but we negotiate the process, right? And sometimes on the opposite end, we think the project could use EVM. So we can suggest it and then negotiate the level of it, right? And it doesn't have to be fully implemented. We implement as we want. And, and there's the difference that, that all we want for the project is the, how, how is the project performing compared to budget, right? So some kind of measure, right? And, and those could be different for different projects, right? If we have a software project, it will be different than personnel, you know, uh, level of effort or constructing number of gadgets or acquisition projects and so on. So how we measure the progress, that's the key here, right? And, and how we do it, uh, 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 mid-scale is very flexible there. Uh, and, and we can negotiate it and so on. And, and if you feel the pain uh, from EVM, uh, that's probably something to discuss with the OPO and then between us, uh, grants and agreements officer and LFO liaison, and we're happy to entertain that, right? Because at different stages of the project, that could change, right? Too. So, and I, I feel like my boss maybe would like to. Yeah. Matt, well, would you like it? No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to plug in. And also, there's also a poster out there, too. And we, we plucked some examples out there to show you how simple it is. So progress against plan. You don't need to make this complicated, right? You can use a simple Excel, right? But, but it is the conversation you want to have with your program officer, how, you might, how you're proposing to actually accomplish that in, a, in the time frame. I think, Roland, you, had one, you wanted to add something to that? Um, I just want to add, to add that um, we do recognize that saying just EVM is not required is not sufficient. So that's something that we are actively working on uh, as to what resources. We don't want to present lists because some may read those lists as being complete <laughs> and comprehensive, and that's not the intent here but we realize that just saying, oh, well, you know, you can use something else other than EVM is not sufficient. We need to say what those choices or what some of those choices are. So that's something we are looking into. Yeah. So. Yeah, so for example, if we have a big project, complex project, and the project team didn't uh, recommend EVM, but we NSF team, through our cost analysis, project PEP analysis, uh, we see the need for EVM, we'll suggest that, right? And, and that will be part of negotiations and could be a, a breaker, right, <laughs> before the award, so. Uh. We, have, we have at least two questions in the queue, and maybe, yes, so it's an add-on to the existing one? Okay, do you mind? We'll just add on to this. We have somebody who wants to add on to this one, and then we'll come right back to you, yep. So, um, 
Yes, I, I just uh, wanted to add on as, as a program officer, since uh, Florence, a lot of this, um, you know, go to the program officer and, and they can <laughs> make some changes. There, there are some limits also to, like we can't completely waive, um, you know, requirements for project management. There's some standard protocols that, that get established. So that's, that's where uh, maybe from the large facilities office, um, like laying down, like Roland was saying, like we, we can't just say not, you know, you can do something else, but defining what that something else is. Um, that's, yeah, that's thank you, Shri. I didn't even recognize you back there with this bright light, so apologies. And then Matt, do, Matt did you want to add on to that or go back to the second? Right, right. Yeah, and so just to follow up on what Roland and Shri just said, this is really where we need input from you. Right now, remember, the guide is always evolving, right? It's guidance, right? And we have a very, you know, we say EVM's not required, and we also say that you should, that sentence I used in my presentation this morning, right? But likely, as Roland and others are suggesting, we need a little bit better guidance in there, right? And so this is where we need input back from you all on through these dialogues on what are the three, I'm just gonna make it up, the three tiers to kind of bucket it, right? To look at, to improve that guidance so it's a little clearer to you all. So that's exactly the dialogue we're hoping to have here to gather that information on what would improve section five of the rig. Zach has been patiently waiting, so. EVM stands for Earn Value Management System, EVMS. Yeah, I, I just wanna say, um, I, I'm the project manager for DKIS, the big, big project that just finished and we did earn value. Now, of course, it's MREFC and it's a whole nother level of pain on top of you. But if honestly, if, you're, you, if it's taking you 20 hours a month to run EVM, you're doing something wrong, okay? And there, I think there's some things you can do to maybe help, uh, maybe do EVM at a higher level in your WBS, not at every single work package level. Maybe there's a simpler way to, to roll it up and work at a higher level. Um, there's things you can do. I think you can work on your process. Um, the thing, when I started as a project manager for DKS, I wasn't sold on EVM. It was like, oh my God, this is just a big hassle. But by the end of the project, I found it extremely useful. Not necessarily the numbers, frankly, but just looking at variance explanations and talking to the, in our case, cost account managers and the lead engineers, trying to understand their numbers to really, because it's just data, right? And if you're just doing it because you have to do it and because the NSF is expecting it, then it's useless for you and it's frankly useless for the NSF. But if you're thinking of it in terms of, hey, this is a tool, um, I've, got a, I've got a variance, okay? I've got a cost variance or a schedule variance. Well, what does that mean? And really trying to understand what that variance means and is it something I have to worry about or is it gonna go away on its own or is it something that's growing with time? That's where EVM really is a helpful tool is to see trends in things. It's not, the process, you can really, as Florence says, you can get it down to a spreadsheet. Literally, we did ours in a spreadsheet. It's a little more than that. And as a good project manager, you're doing actuals anyway. You better be checking your actuals. You better be doing the pieces that go into EVM. And if you've got the pieces, then just running the calculations are actually pretty simple. Um, so that's my comment, I guess. And I'm willing to talk to anybody afterwards about this, my experience. But I'm a convert now. Thank you for that. Um, what other questions? Oh, Carol. So one of the problems about for proposers to the process is how few awards actually happen. I, you know, you can have 50 proposals coming in for, for Misery One and only three or four get funded. And this is a burden on the, uh, the community because it costs money to come up with a PEP, to come up with a plan and do things. And there really isn't a very clear path to how to fund that type of, of jeopardy in the sense that so few people you know, get actual funds. So I wanted a little discussion about is there, if there's a big windfall in this $10 billion increase, et cetera, is that going to help out with the number of proposals? Is it that proposals are good, but there's not enough money and so you rank them and eventually you run out and so the good proposals go wanting? Is it, if you have more money, would there be more proposals that actually get through the, the process? Yeah, I think this is a strategic question. Maybe I'll punt to Roland for that one or even Matt. I mean, I think this is more, I mean, I have my own opinion on that, but. Yeah, the money question. 
Um, yes, yeah, so it's not just the number of awards that we can fund each time, but can we sustain the program, right? Um, we are limited by what is appropriated to um, uh, both of the um, programs. And I, I guess the answer to your windfall question is that if it does occur, um, it's something that I'll definitely take up with my boss, with the, the COF, with Linnea. And it's like, how much of that is going to mid-scale? Um, uh, because it, it's my responsibility to do that. But um, I think that's as much as we can say. Um, what we are trying to do now is to balance the number of awards that's possible. And we understand, you know, I have written grant proposals before I know the amount of work that goes into a competitive proposal. Um, so uh, recognizing that um, uh, there is a limit to the number of awards we can make, uh, one of the ways we try to uh, increase the number of awards is by doing co-funding. Um, this morning I mentioned uh, co-funding with EBSCO. Um, we can explore co-funding with other programs within the agency. Um, uh, but I, I think I am willing, uh, you know, if you have any advice or that, uh, we are willing to hear again what you have to say. And um, uh, my way of working is that everything is on the table. Nothing is on, off the table. So uh, I'm willing to consider um, anything uh, or discuss, at least address any of these things with uh, Linnea. So. I might just add, I'm sure you know that, but uh, NSF is trying to address this through pre-proposals, right? So you don't put all that. You know. That was my point. I was going to say it would really help if there were um, an early pre-proposal before the PEP is written, before other things, you know, before too much is. I know that there are pre-proposals and then there's invitations to for full proposals to help with that. But even trying to get the pre-proposal in puts a burden on. So uh, I'm just wondering, is there a way to make it more, you know, to give a higher success rate to people who actually put the effort in to put a proposal forward. Right, so the pre-proposals are required. Um, a, a PEP is not required before a pre-proposal is submitted. So uh, that decreases the amount. I think Elena was telling me that the draft of the an outline of the PEP is required for the pre-proposals of mid-scale too, but just an outline. Because yes, we understand, we don't want to add burden that isn't going to go for anywhere. So we, we are aware of that, and um, again, it's something we are working on, and we appreciate the comment. We'll try to see what we can do, basically, yeah. And I'll talk a little so, bit more, maybe, about that on Thursday afternoon. So a little appetizer here. <laughs> So, uh, any other questions? Because we do have a couple of for you, but I mean, we want your questions first, please. Yeah, we're, this is the time to get into the dirt, right? Down yeah, the happy dirt. to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, one thing for this group that I kind of wanted to put uh, put out there is one of the things. If you look at the rig, you look at the top of the rig. It suggested. Uh, it seems like NSF wants a resource loaded schedule. That's really a nice thing to have, you know, not required on everything, but a resource loaded schedule is there. So you look at the chart in uh, the first few pages of the rig and it has cost books Excel and it has all this stuff and that. Then it has schedule, uh, Microsoft project or P6 or whatever. And I just wanted to throw it out here for a lot of, of uh, facilities, people that are bidding on this. If you're a Battelle or you're a big company that has a P6 scheduler, there's no problem with the resource loaded schedule. But if you're, uh, it, not as much, but if you're a small one-off organization and don't have a dedicated scheduler, that's a big deal. So is the NSF uh, coming across with any specific procedures on how to have maybe your cost books be in Excel, how do you reconcile them with a scheduled P6 
package and you know at what level does the resource level have to be on the that and if this is too detailed I'll but, go take it somewhere else but okay, I, no but, worries can I ask can I answer kind of generically that's okay yeah, yeah. I think it goes to what Matt's talking about this morning about our plans for the rig it wasn't good enough it's not good enough to say it's not required because words in there that you're pointing out blaze make it sound like, or that's the way you're reading it. So that's super helpful information. But the plan is to fill in those blanks to give guidance back on what is acceptable, right? We're not gonna be prescriptive usually. That's not the way we are because we understand the breadth of projects require different things. But we do wanna address those things. So speaking to the schedule as you're talking about is one area, we're pr probably gonna find it in other areas. So as you go through those, when there's a comment period or even here, point to those words and say, this is what's making me think this is required. That's really helpful information. Did I get it? Yeah. Uh, just to add to that, you know, because I do some consulting and do some stuff. One of the common things, the common problems with a lot of smaller bidders are this whole thing of schedule and how do I do a resource loaded schedule? At what level? How does it integrate? How do I do my cost numbers? And even simple things like uh, what's an estimated actual because my travel expense at the university doesn't come in until three months later. So the sort of things if we could get some, I don't know if you wanna be prescriptive, but it would be nice to have some sort of examples. Thank you, and that's, that's a bit too as well as the templates we've been talking about. And I know, Roland, we've been talking about this too, is having these quasi-templates, right, to help. And then coupled with the additional language in the rig is going to go a long way. So we're learning that pretty quickly that those gaps in information, we need to fill those pretty quickly. Uh, Roland. Yeah, and one thing we realize is that the expertise to do a lot of this is not in the academic arm of institutions. One of the things I realized when I was at my university is that if you go to the facilities folks, they know what they are doing in this space. But, and, and it's one of the things we are trying to include in the webinars and our engagement with the community is where to find help, right? Because in the academic arm of campus, usually no. But you go into the facilities arm of campus and you find that kind of help, that sort of thing. But as Florence said, we are trying to develop a toolkit to help the PIs because we know that it is needed. So, yep. Any other questions? I'm looking at the time. I need to be respectful. Um, but we do have time. For, can we pose a question to the audience? Five more minutes. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I know we had this question. Anybody on the panel want to ask it, or would you like me to? Jason? I don't have the questions. I don't have the questions. Do, oh, we, do we do? Thank you, Shi. Oh, I, I, I kind of want to make a comment, because based on our experience, so um, we got invited, uh, you know, after the proposal. Um, that's before I was involved. I'm a PMP. So, uh, but then the PIs really didn't have much clue as how much project management experience they need on the team in order to put out a reasonable PEP, right? A, a good PEP for the um, reverse site visit. So when I was engaged, that was one month before the reverse site visit. And the PIs didn't even know that the major facility guide at the time was applicable <laughs> to the proposal. So I didn't see the document until two weeks before the reverse site visit, not to mention that cost book requirement. In reality, if we knew about it, uh, if I knew about it, I would have forced the PIs to sit with me to go over their scope and break it down, you know, go build a reasonable WBS structure and do the resource loaded project plan because eventually a resource loaded project schedule will make the cost book creation like a breeze of wind. You know, without that, the cost book is gonna be very hard to create. 
you're not going to be able to align the schedule with the cost book reasonably. So there is a certain sequential order of things that has to happen, and the PIs have to know about it early enough. So that's, you know, I just want to make that comment. Yeah, no, thank you for the lessons learned. It's a sneak peek into some of the sessions that follow at this one. But if you guys are okay with this, if we, even if we don't answer it in this session, we would love to hear from you. We have a little booth over there. We're interested in knowing, hearing from you on what part of the process you've heard about that you guys find most difficult and why. So give that some thought. We're, we're wondering about the booths. We would love to hear if, if you look at it and say, I, don't, I saw this cost analysis process, my gosh, I don't understand that, it's difficult. Let us know, because that's the part about updating the guide, right, the rig, making sure that it's clear and transparent. And we like to work on streamlining our processes as, as well. So we need your help. I'm looking at the clock. Any last words? We have four minutes. I just want to thank Florence and everyone who helped us prepare that, but particularly Florence. Yeah, thanks. Any last words from the team? Great. So I think I'm looking at... That yeah. tailoring session on Thursday afternoon. A lot of the questions here will be answered. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you show up to Rich's session for sure. He's going to have some great, great guidance. Uh, let's see. I'm supposed to uh, let you guys go for a break, and then we're going to get started at the next session on time at 2.45, so keep an eye on that. And then I know that she's gonna be up here and she's gonna be sharing more lessons learned with Franco and others. So thank you guys for your time and your input and questions. We'll see you out there. <laughs>